I sat one day in 1960 in a hammock in a thatched roofed house in the eastern jungle of Ecuador. On the floor in the same house sat an Alka Indian by the name of Gikita. He was holding the microphone of a little tape recorder, a very primitive tape recorder in those days, and he was telling me in detail what had happened that afternoon in January of 1956 when he and four other Alka men had speared five American missionaries to death. His talk sounded a little bit like this. <laughs> That's the actual voice of Gikita, a man probably in his mid-40s, tall and very much of a joker, but he loved to tell stories of spearings, and the voice that you hear is Gikita's telling a story of some spearings that had taken place in the past. Words like geno gebu wenging means what in the world shall I do in order that he die? And then you hear him say tenonde kiwinani tapa, which means they just spent their days spearing, they lived spearing. At one point you hear him say inimi, which is the question to me, do you understand? And I said, huh? which is the Alka way of saying yes. Jim Elliott was one of the five missionaries whom Gikita and four other Alka Indians killed in 1956. <coughs> the story of their death was broadcast around the world, published in many newspapers and magazines. And since that time, because of Jim's biography, Shadow of the Almighty, he has become to many people something of a hero, almost legendary. And according to some who have spoken to me, not quite human. But he was human. He was a real man. I know. I was his wife. I thought it might help to tell a little bit of his story and to let you hear his own voice so that you could believe, too, that he was human, that he was an ordinary man, and perhaps the story will help you to see how he got where he got. He was from Portland, Oregon. His father was an itinerant Plymouth Brethren preacher, and his mother was a chiropractor who came from a sheep ranch in eastern Washington. He went to public schools in Portland and then to Wheaton College in Illinois with the purpose of getting a BA and, as he said, an AUG, a degree that Wheaton College didn't offer then, and I don't think any other college can offer. He got the idea from Paul's epistle to Timothy, approved unto God. That was the primary object of Jim's life, to be approved unto God. His life, I think, was characterized by a verse in 1 Corinthians 8. We should remember that while knowledge may make a man look big, it is only love that can make him grow to his full stature. For whatever a man may know, he still has a lot to learn. But if he loves God, he is opening his whole life to the Spirit of God. Jim loved God. He wanted to open his whole life to the Spirit of God. And in order to do this, 
he made the choice to obey him. Any choice is a limitation. Any limitation implies that certain other things must be eliminated. And among the things that Jim decided he could eliminate when he went to college were social activities and girls. He had spent a lot of time on both when he was in high school and made up his mind when he entered Wheaton that he was going to concentrate on studies. And it was not only his formal studies, but also his own private Bible study, which he wanted to concentrate on. In order to do that, he had to eliminate a certain amount of sleep. He got up early in the morning. He was realistic enough to know that unless he got up early enough before breakfast to have time for Bible study and prayer, there wouldn't be any time during the rest of a busy college day. So every morning he got up perhaps around 5, studied his Bible, prayed, and made notes in a journal. His primary object in doing this was for self-discipline. In order to force himself to articulate specific things that he had learned from the Bible and to write down certain prayers that he was praying in order that he might be able to check back and see how God had answered them. This, I think, characterizes the seriousness of his purpose. He was also an officer in the Foreign Missions Fellowship. He loved to sing. I can remember his hearty, unmodulated voice singing very loudly, Who is on the Lord's side? By thy love constraining, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are thine. So he was spiritually minded. He was also interested in poetry, almost any kind of poetry, from the ancient mariner or the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam to the cremation of Sam McGee and the face on the barroom floor, poems by Robert Service, which he had memorized and could easily be persuaded to recite at the drop of a hat. His personality was forthright and cheerful. He would memorize scripture as he stood in the dining hall lines, and it wasn't unusual for him to grab somebody else by the collar and say, Brother, what did you get from the Lord today? Or with a friendly grin, How come you're not going to the mission field? It always seemed to him that the burden of proof should lie with the man who was not going to the field rather than with the one who had decided to go. If he wasn't memorizing little cards with scripture verses on them, he often memorized Greek verbs. I can still hear him saying, a me, a est, es men, este, es And he managed to graduate with highest honor in Greek. He wasn't merely a spiritually minded student or merely an honors student. He was also a good wrestler. His junior year in college, he won the wrestling championship of four states in his weight. So there was a sense in which Jim was a very unusual student. But in looking at these characteristics, we see that it was here that the ground was prepared in which his faith grew. The clues to the quality of a man's character and the degree of his commitment are there when he's a college student. What he is on the campus, what he is in the classroom, what he is in the privacy of his dorm room is what the man is. Perhaps the severest test of a man's determination to obey God is in his love life. A week before my graduation from Wheaton, Jim confessed that he loved me. A staggering surprise to me who had hardly dared to hope that this handsome, intelligent, likable, and spiritually minded student could possibly glance in my direction. I had been a wallflower most of my high school and college days. I was doubly surprised to learn that so far as Jim could see, God was leading him to the mission field single. I had just finished struggling with the question of singleness myself. Not that there was any real possibility on the horizon for marriage, but I had told God a year or so earlier that I would be a missionary and had then faced the question of remaining single for the rest of my life. I didn't particularly relish the prospect, but I had come to the place of saying, Yes, Lord, if that's what you want, that's what I want. And here we were, 
a week before my graduation, acknowledging to one another that we loved each other. What to do with one's feelings when they're that overwhelming? We talked about them several nights in a row and finally agreed that we would not write to each other for at least three months. When the three months were up, it seemed that God was saying, yes, we could, just merely giving us permission. It wasn't as though God was giving us a blueprint for the future and saying that he was going to bring us together as husband and wife. But we did agree to start a casual correspondence. In one of Jim's letters, he wrote this to me. There is within a hunger after God, given of God, filled by God. I can be happy when I am conscious that he is doing what he wills to do within. What makes me tremble is that I might allow something else, you, for example, to take the place my God should have. I tremble lest in any way I offend my eternal lover. Whatever passes between you and me, let us take note of this. All shall be revoked at his command. Above all else, I will that he might find in me the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Reading in Nehemiah these days, are we willing to build with a trowel in one hand while the other grasps a sword? That's the end of the quotation from Jim's letter. Our letters were very infrequent, but in another one he wrote, Did I not sense the value of discipline, I would counsel you to give way to any urges to communicate. However, we best learn patience by practicing it. After graduation from college, Jim spent some time at home in Portland, subjected to what he called the test of free time, a little bit like the Apostle Paul, who went into Arabia for three years before he began public ministry. Jim spent the time writing, reading, praying, helping now and then with the housework, preaching on the street and in prison and in the gospel halls, teaching in a Christian school. And among the fruits of that year of silence were his journals, which have been published by Ravel in 1978 under the title, The Journals of Jim Elliot. And one of the most remarkable quotations from that journal comes from that year at home, when he was just 22, he wrote these words, which appear to be prophetic in view of subsequent events in his life. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Some of his friends criticized him for not finding a job immediately, for apparently doing nothing, but he was content to bow to God's will, and to spend the time in hard self-discipline of studying and working and doing things in unobtrusive and unspectacular ways. Another part of his preparation for missionary work was living in the little town of Chester, Illinois, with Ed McCulley, who had also graduated in the class of 49 from Wheaton College. Ed had been a football player, had intended to go into business or law, certainly had never intended to go into missionary work, but Jim had gotten acquainted with him when they were seniors and had begun to pray that God would send Ed McCulley to the mission field. The call came, and Ed agreed to work with Jim by way of preparation, and the two of them went to this little town where there really wasn't very much of a church and started work for children a little Sunday school called the River Rats Sunday School, a name that the children had chosen for themselves. They started a radio broadcast called the March of Truth, on which they took turns preaching, and spent a year in this small attempt at missionary work. Going back to Portland, Jim continued to pray that God would guide him clearly as to which mission field he was to go to, provide the money, and give him the backing of his Christians in the assembly, where he was a member. He began to correspond with several different missionaries, one in India and one in Ecuador, and eventually began to believe that God was indeed calling him specifically to Indian tribal work in Ecuador. 
At the time when he was about to go down to find out about passage on a ship for Ecuador, he had been given small sums of money here and there from people who had heard him preach or who knew of his missionary conviction, and he had simply put the money in a drawer without counting it. The day he went down to inquire about passage on a boat, he found out that it was going to cost him $315. He went back and counted the money in the drawer, and it amounted to $315. He began to pray that God would send several single men with him. Ed McCulley was his first hope, and then Ed disappointed him by getting married. That didn't mean that Ed wasn't going to the mission field. He did end up in Ecuador along with Jim, but not his single colleague, as Jim had prayed. The next person that he found was a young man by the name of Pete Fleming, a graduate of the University of Washington, an M.A. in literature, and also a man who had not particularly considered going to the mission field. When they had discussed it several times, Jim wrote to Pete this letter. The command is plain. You go into the whole world and announce the good news. It cannot be dispensationalized, typicalized, or rationalized. It stands a clear command, possible of realization because of the commander's following promise. To me, Ecuador is simply an avenue of obedience to the simple word of Christ. There is room for me there, and I am free to go. This is, of course, true of a great many other places, but having said there is a need and sensed my freedom through several years of waiting in prayer for leading on this very point of where, I now feel peace in saying, I go, sir, by grace. My experience is by no means restrictive to your persuasion. You may require more or less of subjective evidence to find certainty. I haven't the foggiest idea how or where God will lead you. Of this I am sure he will lead you and not let you miss your signs. Rest in this. It is his business to lead, command, impel, send, call, or whatever you want to call it. It is your business to obey, follow, move, respond, or what have you. Jim and Pete went to Ecuador as colleagues in 1952. They lived in Quito with the white Ecuadorian family in order to learn Spanish, and then moved over the Andes into the eastern jungle to a place called Shandia. They spent their first year in Shandia learning the Quechua language and rebuilding some dilapidated buildings from an old mission station and building some new buildings, a clinic and a school. The atmosphere of the jungle was just what they had expected, great trees, mighty rivers running into the Amazon, with calls of strange birds. And here's another one of those tapes that we made giving us the sound of jungle bird calls. One of the things that they did during that year was to start a boys' school and try to teach the Indian boys to read. 
Jim wrote a letter to someone back in the States giving an idea of his goals at that time. This is what he said. You wonder why people choose fields away from the States when young people at home are drifting because no one wants to take time to listen to their problems. I'll tell you why I left. Because those stateside young people have every opportunity to study, hear, and understand the Word of God in their own language. And these Indians have no opportunity whatsoever. I have had to make a cross of two logs and lie down on it to show the Indians what it means to crucify a man. When there's that much ignorance over here and so much knowledge and opportunity over there, I have no question in my mind why God sent me here. Those whimpering stateside young people will wake up on the day of judgment, condemned to worse fates than these demon-fearing Indians, because having a Bible they were bored with it, while these never heard of such a thing as writing. They started a church. Naturally, they began by simply telling the stories of the gospel, and in not very many months, they had several Indians who wanted to be baptized, and they became the nucleus of a church. Here's a tape that they made of the Indians singing some gospel songs. And here is Jim, preaching in the usual Sunday morning meeting. You can hear the usual accompaniments, dogs barking, babies crying. This was one of Jim's earlier attempts at preaching in the Quechua language. Kanguna ruku amigo asha. Kanguna ucharash kamanda sakina mangichi. Mana lulu wawa shi. Mana lulu wawa wawa guna guma wawa guna lama. Masnari. Ari. Randi ruku guna pura kasta sakina mangichi. Warmi guna lulu shimi manda sakina mangichi. Warmi guna yapa kaya sapa ashi. Kaya sapa asha. Ministingichi kaishi mira kishpichin shmushu warmi ali warmi era tuku tuku chingami ya ya dios pushi mira kirikpi Jesus ta kirisha kamba ucharash kamanda sakisha kasna tukungami. In Jim's sermon, he's talking about the necessity to pray for help. He says, if you pray for help, the Holy Spirit will help you. You women, you old people. You children, and here he stumbled quite a bit over some of the differences in forms of plurals. We had originally learned the Puyupungu dialect, and the word for old people would be Rukuguna, and then in the Quechua dialect it came out Rukuuna, and sometimes Jim had troubles with that, so a couple of times he has to stop and ask for help. Then he says, God will save you. You women can become good wives. This is the sort of thing that will happen around here if you believe the words that I'm telling you. In October of 1953, Jim and I were married in Quito. I had been working on the other side of the Andes with a small tribe of Indians called the Colorados. We were not engaged until January of 1953, having waited nearly five years for God's go-ahead. We went to Panama for our honeymoon and then on up to Costa Rica, where my brother, Dave Howard, had just begun his missionary work. While we were visiting Dave and his wife, Phyllis, 
they asked us to make a tape telling some of our jungle experiences. This is a part of that honeymoon tape with Jim telling the story of a night that he spent with a witch doctor. I got a letter from a friend of mine in Portland not too long ago, and he asked me a very blunt question, and a question that I can't really answer uh, directly and for sure. He said, with all your travels down in the jungle, have you run across any devils yet? I'm not sure about that, but I have run across some witchcraft and had the opportunity to observe it firsthand. One night we were called on to inject a little baby, a baby of about eight months, I suppose, who had a pretty clear case of pneumonia. And um, she happened to be the uh, granddaughter of the most effective witch. He's not too good a witch, <laughs> but uh, among the Indians, he's regarded as a pretty famous witch in our area. So I went down in the afternoon, and we, got, we injected the baby with some penicillin and uh, tried to make it more comfortable than it was, but it was pretty obviously in bad condition and um, looked like it might not live out the night. So I decided to stay through the night to see if I couldn't be of some help later on. It was the first night that I'd ever spent in an Indian house. It happened some time ago now. About um, 5.30 or so in the afternoon, they came and told me they'd killed a great big snake a little ways upriver, and they wanted me to come up and skin the thing. The Indians aren't too happy about touching snakes, so I gladly complied and went on up to the house to find a, about a 10-foot Bushmaster, the largest and the deadliest of the South American vipers, um, hung up next to the house, skinned the thing, and found that the white, the meat looked nice and white, and wondered if maybe it might, might not be a good thing to try for supper, seeing as the Indians hadn't offered me any. So we cut off a couple of steaks, and I went in, and we roasted them over the fire, and um, had a little Bushmaster steak that night, and then went back to the house where the sick person was. When I arrived back, um, I had given notice, rather sudden, that I was going to uh, stay all night, and the witch the grandfather witch <laughs> had looked a little discouraged at the prospect but they had the bed fixed up for me and so he bluntly told me after a little conversation that I wasn't to have any part in the evening's proceedings that he intended to witch his granddaughter and that I was to lay over in the corner without any uh, questions without any noise without any light and uh, just observe or if I wanted to and as they preferred to sleep probably 20 feet away was a small coal fire, <clears throat> and that is a fire of coals. Then about um, 8.30, I suppose it was, maybe 9 o'clock, I began to uh, doze off and went to sleep and was wakened by um, the sound of a woman coming up and waking a man who'd laid down, who had lain down on the floor beside me, uh, who was supposed to be one of the watchers. When they <clears throat> witch a person, several of them, usually two, or sometimes three, will drink a very strong intoxicating root that they call the bitter root. And this root knocks them out immediately into a drunken stupor. And in this drunken stupor, they see visions and are supposed to um, hear from the spirits the um, words that will, uh, the words incantated, in, how do you say that? Spoken over the, uh, over the body <laughs> of the sick one which will uh, cure the sickness. But because they're in a stupor, they don't know what to do if the spirit should speak anything that is important. They don't know what to do uh, because they're in the stupor. So they always have for each man who takes the drink a watcher who sits beside him and listens to everything that he says in his stupor. Well, this show didn't turn out to be too fancy, but anyhow, the watchers had all gone to sleep, and when the men were re the witches were ready to drink, um, they had to be waked up, and in the process of waking them up, I woke too. They all were very quiet about it, and there was no noise. Outside there was a brilliant moon, and it could be seen filtering just barely through the uh, cracks in the bamboo walls. And um, there was a time of talking quietly of the three witches and their watchers, and then and suddenly began a sound which I don't think I've ever heard imitated anywhere else, which is made by <clears throat> taking leaves, which appear to be dry, though I've never seen the branch that they do it with, and beating it slowly and in a rhythm something like this over the body of the sick one. And while they beat, the witch always whistles. And this whistle is the summoning whistle of the spirit. It's supposed to bring the spirit down from the mountains in order that he'll be around when they drink. And while they're doing this, they do the drinking as well. 
so that you'd hear the ch of the leaves beating on the body of the baby, and then this whistle. And that continued indefinitely along with this swishing noise of the leaves and then after some time you hear it stop for a moment and then there's a terrible gagging because this root that they take is terrifically bitter and even the witches I guess have trouble getting it down they only take just two or three sips that knocks them right out and soon after they've taken a little bit a little bit more the whistles get slower and the beating gets slower and you realize that the witch is going under and as he goes under he's supposed to in to uh, see visions and evidently they do see visions you don't have to call the spirit to see them, evidently having taken this strong drug, because there are white men in the area who have taken the drug and say that it gives terrific visions of, of um, jungle life. Maybe because their life mostly centers in the jungle, but they see, they see serpents and are always attacked by wild animals, and terrible things in swamps and all and such. And that is what they went through next after the swishing had ceased and the whistling and the gagging uh, from their taking of this drink. There was silence and then the mumbling, and that went on for a long time. Just the mumbling of these witches supposed to be saying something that I couldn't understand. And then I went to sleep. I woke up about 11.30, and the uh, show seemed to be over. They turned the kerosene lamp back on as they uh, lit it again, and they were playing. They have a three-stringed violin which, on which they play one single tune. The tune goes something like this. Well, I struck up a conversation with the man at the violin, and he said that nothing had happened, that the witches hadn't had any success because they were, they were frightened to take too much of the drink, and that they had done a little bit of witching. They, the idea is that when they, they um, um, go on to the, uh, they get the witching instructions from the spirit, then they go on and treat the baby, and they treat the, or the patient, whoever it is, they treat them by taking smoke into their mouths from a brand, and then going over the head of the baby or whatever part is it is affected the affected part is supposed to be revealed by the spirit and they blow smoke you hear a big puffing noise and and uh, you see them do it you see smoke just pour out of their mouth they have a special way of doing it and sort of pops out and covers the whole of the area and almost like a sheet or a, a film of smoke that rolls out of their mouths with this popping and uh, this was done but evidently to no effect the theory, the Indian theory of disease is that something gets into the body, whether it be in the head or the throat or the chest or the abdomen or the leg, and that the witch, by this blowing and a certain sucking that he does, extracts this thing, whatever it be, a piece of chanta palm or, or a piece of mirror, a piece of glass or a stone, and then he spits it out from having extracted it from the body. And therein lies the witchcraft. But evidently, they have not succeeded in getting anything out. It may have been that the witches took too much or... Um, were too far under to really uh, find whatever it was was bothering the baby. Well, we had a chat with the, the um, um, people in the house for a while, and then about 1.30, after checking the baby and asking if I couldn't give another uh, penicillin injection, but being refused by the witch's family, um, I went back and lay down over in the bamboo mat. Then, about 3 o'clock, I was roused again by the death whale. Evidently, the baby had died quite quietly without any struggle about 3 o'clock in the morning, and the mother and uh, a couple of the attendant lay women who were around uh, using tobacco to uh, try and give the baby some relief by patting it on and keeping hot stones around it, things like that, uh, had failed, and the baby had died. So that was the first encounter I'd really had with witchcraft. We've had a couple of encounters since and learned a little more about the Indian psychology in it. We find that they don't believe in anything, uh, as far as disease is concerned, they don't believe that any sickness comes apart from some sort of witching, and therefore that without witching, no matter what white man's medicines might be given, 
there is no cure because it comes by witching some witch sends sickness also a witch must uh, be the one who saves them from it even our believers are uh, those who believe the word and have come to know the Lord are taken in by the idea and will call witches and have them in camp over them before they really feel like they've done all they can to extract disease from their bodies. I guess that's the story you wanted to hear, wasn't it, Dave? Then Dave asked if Jim and I would be willing to carry on a little conversation in Quechua. People always want to hear how the language sounds. So here we are talking Quechua. Jim was, of course, by this time quite proficient. I, having been work, working with the Colorado Indians, knew very little Quechua at that point, although I had had to learn some because of Jim's stipulation when he proposed to me that he would not marry me until I learned Quechua. So I had a crude working knowledge, shall we say, as will be evident from this next snatch of our conversation. Now we're going to get Betty and Jim to carry on a little conversation in Quechua for you, so you'll get an idea what that sounds like. When they asked my wife when we were being married if she really wanted to marry me, she um, is getting so proficient in the Indian language that she almost answered in Quechua. So we'll give you a little bit of what it sounds like, although our accent is quite gringos. Uh, still, we suppose. Recupa in Yucavar, mi causa ngicho. Causa nimi. Imara, imara rakangi kuna punja. Imara rakangi kuna punja ni. Manima. Manima, cierto pache, manima strakangi. Yapa kili nai nyukubari, manima strakangi kuna tukwe punja. Yapa kili on. Now tell us what you were talking about. I asked her if she was, al was alive, that's her way of saying, are you well? And she said yes, and I asked her what she was doing, and she said she wasn't doing anything, and I agreed quite heartily with that. <laughs> After we were married, Jim and I worked together in a little place called Puyupungu, where no missionary had ever been before. We then went back to the station in Shandia, where Jim and Pete had been working. Pete had gone in the meantime to the States to get married and had come back with his bride. In 1955, our daughter Valerie was born, and later that year, Nate Saint, the pilot who served the jungle stations, discovered some inhabited Alka houses. The Alkas, A-U-C-A, were known to be savages. No white man had ever gone into their territory and come out alive. Jim had been praying for the salvation of the Alkas since before he went to Ecuador. And the closer he got to them in the jungle, the more his heart was burdened that God would open the door for the gospel to be taken to them. When Nate announced that he had discovered some inhabited Alka houses, Jim and Ed got very much excited, and the three began to pray that God would show them what to do. Over a period of months, they flew over the Alka houses and dropped gifts from a small plane with the hope that these gifts would demonstrate to the Indians that the white man was, after all, friendly. Through much prayer and preparation, the three men decided that there should be at least two others share in this venture, and the two that they asked were Pete Fleming and Roger Udarian. In January of 1956, these five men decided to make their first attempt to reach the Alka Indians on the ground having dropped gifts regularly over a period of more than three months. On the eve of January the 1st, 1956, the five men sang together, We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. One week later, all five of them had been speared to death by the Indians that they had sought to reach. We knew nothing about the reasons. We only knew that the Alcas were savages. We knew also that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. We also knew that our hearts were broken, that we were baffled, that five men who had trusted God, who had prayed, who had been so clearly guided each step of the way, and who had placed their confidence in the Lord as shield and defender, should be speared to death. We only knew the word of Scripture in 1 John, the world 
and all its passionate desires will one day disappear. But the man who is following the will of God is part of the permanent and cannot die. I prayed one of the more absurd prayers of my life at that time. I've prayed a lot of prayers which seemed absurd to me at the time and some of them which seemed even more absurd later on. But it seemed only reasonable to me to say, Lord, if there's anything that you want me to do about those alkas, send me. Here I was, a widow with a baby just 10 months old, but I said, Lord, show me if there's anything I can do. I believe that God's guidance comes primarily through the doing of our ordinary, everyday duties. And my duties following Jim's death were simply to run the station in Shandia. I was alone there. I had Indians working for me. I had the church. I had the school. I had an Indian women's reading class and plenty of other things to do. And Jim and I had begun the translation of the New Testament. And so I continued with that work, praying periodically that the Lord would open the door to the Alcas if this was what he wanted. I haven't got nearly enough time on this tape to tell you how we got there, but in 1958, God answered that prayer. Rachel Saint, the sister of Nate Saint, the pilot who had also been killed, Rachel and my daughter Valerie, who was by that time three years old, and I went in and saw for the first time the Alka Indians who had killed those five missionaries. Valerie and I lived there for two years in a jungle clearing. I recognized immediately that I was a freak, head and shoulders taller than the tallest Indian, pitiful blue eyes like a jaguar's, they said, hair that looked like palm fiber. I couldn't do anything the way they did it. I didn't know how to make clay pots or weave hammocks, didn't know how to catch fish with my hands or plant manioc couldn't speak their language, couldn't do anything that a normal 10-year-old could do. Naturally, in the judgment of the Indians, I must be retarded. I was a freak. I was a liability economically because I had absolutely nothing to contribute that they wanted. They were a naked people, happy in their nakedness. They didn't need clothing. They didn't need improved housing, even though their houses were nothing but leaf roofs on about six poles, no walls, no floors, no furniture. Their diet was adequate. They were rarely sick. They seemed to have very little need of medicine, no conscious need of education or any improvements whatsoever. And so what could I contribute? They had no idea of exchange, so if they gave me food, I had nothing to offer in return. I was therefore a freak and a liability. I discovered that I was also an oracle. Even when I could hardly speak the language at all, they would repeat things that I said as though they were inspired. I lived as they did in a house without walls, and frequently in the morning I would be awakened anywhere from 2 to 5 o'clock with Alka singing. And this is what it sounded like. <laughs> Alka songs had a maximum of three notes, sometimes only two. Very monotonous. I've counted as many as 70 repetitions of a single verse. Valerie, of course, learned to sing their songs and learned to speak their language very quickly. I had made up my mind when I went in there to live with the Alkas that perhaps with my linguistic background and my systems of mnemonics and my notebook and my tape recorder that I would be able to keep up with a three-year-old. It was a very naive hope. Valerie was talking fluently within a matter of weeks and learned very quickly to say, ha, come 
which means everybody listened to this when I would be trying to speak Alka, or if I was trying to make a clay pot or weave a hammock, as the women frequently insisted that I try to do, Valerie would yell out, Kyaka, which means everybody get a load of this, everybody watch this. This is a tape of Valerie speaking Alka. And this is the way the Alka's taught. ゲームのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオアキミのバイオア
For every cross endured for Christ's sake, there is the joy of resurrection. Jim Elliot believed that, quite simply and absolutely. Every man who knows my commandments and obeys them, Jesus said, is the man who really loves me. And every man who really loves me will himself be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and make myself known to him. That's the only way to get to know God. That's the way Jim learned to know him. So this is Jim's story. I said at the beginning of the tape that he is seen by many as a hero. It's encouraging to know that men who by faith have done the will of God are heroes to some. In a time when the popular heroes are often men whose aims are thoroughly selfish or secular. May God give us grace to follow their example of trust and simple daily obedience. Be thou faithful unto death, Christ says to us, and I will give thee the crown of life.